In this video, we're going to be talking about the latest episode of 90 Day Fiancé The Single Life. And it's cool. So, this episode was really interesting to find out what drives a person, what are different people looking for in their relationships. For example, you've got Debbie. Now, by her own admission, Debbie was a bit of a wild child back in the 60s and 70s. I was a slut. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Debbie, thanks for that. Now that she's getting back out on the dating scene, it seems like those messaging her are only interested in one thing. Most of the people that are DMing me in my app, they want a quickie, a one night stand, uh, something. And it's pretty handy because she seems to be up for it too. It's been a long time since I had some strange man in my bed. Yeah? Did you like it? Only problem is, she's got high standards. Anyone jumping into her bed needs to be able to satisfy her. I was very disappointed. Oh, really? Just didn't sound like they, they uh, were in tune sexually, really. And how awkward is it that she and Colt both like the same things in bed? <laughs> awkward. It is really embarrassing for somebody to tell you that you do the same thing in bed that your son does in bed. Now, as far as Colt's concerned, we actually learn quite a lot about why exactly their relationship is so unhealthily close. Debbie reveals that Colt was actually, quote, a miracle baby. You see, doctors actually told Debbie that she wouldn't be able to conceive. And when she did have Colt, he was born early and not expected to live. He actually spent the first five months of his life on a ventilator. And while that doesn't excuse their relationship and how awkward it kind of is... It does go some way into explaining why she's finding it so hard to let him go. She definitely feels hurt by the fact that Colt and Vanessa want to move out. Well, not so much that they want to move out. She kind of accepts that, or so she says. It's more the way that he, quote, blindsided her with the announcement. And although she still gives Colt the cold shoulder this episode. Hey, mom. Yeah. It's clear that she's beginning to come round to the advantages of having her own private space. Yeah, it's good that we get away from each other for a while. I don't know. It's something about the idea of Debbie be <laughs> being a slut that really puts me off my breakfast. What I took from this, it's really interesting how her past relationships, whether that's, you know, her dating past or her past with her son, it's impacting her present day. And someone else who's being impacted by past relationships is Natalie. Now, here's the thing. We've always known that Natalie thinks a lot of herself. But it's become really clear to me that she sees herself as the beauty and everyone else as the beast. Nice man entered the door and it was beasts around. And now that she's in Florida, what's more fitting for someone as beautiful as her than to try and get a job as a model? And obviously when you're as beautiful as Natalie, the natural thing here is to try and hook up or sleep your way to the top with people already in the industry. I went to this model platform. They have opportunity to meet uh, agents. So I decided to ask. I'm like, does he know someone? Make me a date. Which leads us nicely onto her date with model Johnny. The problem is, when you have such a high opinion of yourself, it's very difficult to have others match your expectations. Practically the very first conversation she has with Johnny revolves around the fact that he's drinking. And as we all know, Natalie isn't a fan of drink, despite the fact they're actually meeting at a bar. Either way, it becomes very clear that she's assessing this guy on the very first date through the lens of whether or not he's fit to father her child, which is definitely putting a lot of pressure on herself. I want to know who is he. I want to consider does he fit into the idea of being my husband and the father of my child? She tells us that she's not willing to date a man who puts alcohol before her, like Mike apparently did. Michael never choose me over alcohol. And when she arrives to the date and sees that Johnny has a vodka Red Bull in his hand, she launches into this really weird, really awkward rant about how she's only willing to drink water because she wants to make sure her kids will be healthy. Because I want to be a mother and I want to have a child. And I'm sorry for that. I'm difficult. It's the way I am. So I better drink water, but my child's going to be healthy. I'm telling you. I'm sorry. Now look, I've got absolutely no problem with Natalie choosing not to drink. That's her prerogative. But what really grinds on me is the whole holier-than-thou attitude that she has. She really does look down on everyone. And at that point, most normal men would run a mile if that's the first interaction you have on a first date. 
But for whatever reason, Johnny, who himself claims to be very good with women, puts his drink on the bar and then starts smooth talking Natalie, telling her how attractive she is and getting touchy feely with her. And then we see more evidence that Natalie was scarred in her last relationship with Mike. Her next question to Johnny is, So you believe in God? Yeah, keeping things nice and light for date one, hey? She can't deal with another guy that believes in aliens over religion. My marriage with Mike was spoiled by him believing in aliens. So yeah, although Natalie claims that she's trying to be a lot more guarded and doesn't want any more divorces, it seems like these two have hit it off. They're getting on like a house on fire and they arrange for a second date. So let's see how this one pans out. Now, someone else who finds himself in a weird situation with his relationship is Sinjin. He's still together with Tanya, or more accurately, they're still living in the same house, sharing the same bed, licking each other's fingers, but their relationship is over. They're not together anymore. In a meeting with his psychic, he kind of reveals that he was caught in a lust bubble with Tanya, but beyond the lust and the physical attraction, they want very different things from life. He is adamant he doesn't want to change. He likes the way he is, his free-spirited, fun-loving nature. And he doesn't want kids, which is a huge issue for Tanya. To be completely honest with you, this was on the cards. This was brutally obvious to everyone from the very start. She's a very, very different character to him. And while they both admit that they still love each other, and in fact, she still hopes that it can work out. She doesn't want a divorce. She wants to separate, spend time apart, but hope that they'll get back together. Whereas he thinks they both need a clean break. In other words, not having her do his laundry. They have a heart to heart and it seems like the no kids thing really is a deal breaker for Tanya. But like, try for what though? Like we could try all of this, but like at the end of the day, like you still wouldn't want kids, you know? And it breaks my heart because I know it's something you really want. There's no healthy boundaries between these two. There's clearly a very, very weird dynamic. Sinjin is very clearly still hurt by the fact that before their wedding, Tanya revealed he's not her soulmate. And so here he is ready to go and find the one. But if she's offering it to him on a plate, he's not gonna say no. Even though me and Tanya decided to separate, we still sleeping in the same bed and still having sex. It's not the, the normal kind of sex, you know? It's almost heartbreak. I almost want to start crying. But I'm down to have sex regardless if I'm happy, sad, crying. I'm always hard. Yeah, very, very weird relationship right there. You want to keep a pair of my underwear? No, no, I don't want to keep a pair of your underwear. Another weird relationship is Jennifer and Jesse. These two just seem like a very mismatched couple. So after flying from Russia to finally meet Jennifer in person in Colombia, Jennifer is waiting for some kind of passion, whereas Jesse seems to want to take it slow. As we've come to learn with Jesse, he thinks of himself as some kind of deep thinking spiritual person, a philosopher of our times. And he talks about how he wants to stay patient with the sexual energy and he starts going all Shakespeare on her with things like, oh, Listen, I, I, as long as I'm in your presence, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> I don't care where we are or what we do. As long as I'm around you, that's what it's all about. But the only problem is she just wants to get down and dirty. She wants that physical intimacy. She's looking for a man that will just grab her and kiss her when they first meet. And she confesses that she's finding it strange that he's so slow to get passionate. I want a strong man and someone that isn't afraid to show me that he gets very animalistic. This is like a, a storm of feelings and emotions that are, you know, waking up and starting to boil. I want to really take my time and to understand what this is. Good thing then that she's got another man on the side. <laughs> Maybe she can get that passion from him. And you've got to laugh because on the one hand, she's keeping that other relationship hidden from Jesse. But when he asks her, have you been single for three years? She confirms she has, only to then turn around and say, oh, I'm pretty sure Jesse thinks I've been single for three years. Well, yeah, I wonder where he got that idea from. <laughs> and um, for you, like, you know, now I think you've been single for three years, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've been single for three years. I'm pretty sure that Jesse thinks that I'm being single all this time. 
but I did date someone. Yeah, I think this relationship is also destined to be doomed right from the very start. Finally this week, we've got Big Ed. Ed is another one who's still suffering from the consequences of past relationships. In fact, I think Mia absolutely nails it when she says, He preferred to be in a toxic relationship and to be with someone than to be solo and happy. Bingo. She's nailed it. That's correct. That is absolutely 100% Ed. He's got this problem with being alone. I think he has a self-worth issue. He's uncomfortable in his own skin, no matter how much of a joke he makes of it. And actually, he even says something very telling to her when he says, <sighs> I'm not worthy. <laughs> I'm not worthy of you. I'm sorry. Just... You're awesome. Thank you. Anyway, although Mia doesn't commit to a second date, and I mean, you can't really blame her after the car crash of the first date. If you haven't seen my last video where I go over that first date, I'll leave a link for that in the description below so you can catch up. But yeah, all in all, very short segment from Ed this week, but it seems the date didn't go all that well with Mia. However, he has had a big realization. I've learned that I can date closer to my age. I don't have to be with a young person in their 20s. I don't have to have that, which for me is huge. Now, I've got a favor to ask. I'm doing everything I possibly can to get these videos published and there for you to watch the same day the episode drops. But have you ever tried writing a script that's nearly 10 minutes in length and then video editing it? <laughs> it's not easy. So please, if you enjoyed this video, hit that thumbs up button. It doesn't cost you anything, but it really gives me motivation to keep going. Thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you on the next video.